that, we're going to get started. Welcome so much to supporting English learners in the mathematics classroom. We're going to be focusing today on a couple of things. Um, and so here we are. So just to get us started, um, for those of you that are joining us and have joined us before, you know that we like to just talk a little bit about our Zoom etiquette. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on that because I think most of us are pretty zoomed out and we kind of have all those um, tools are really familiar with for us now. But if you have any questions, please make sure you put them in the chat. Rosemary's gonna be manning the chat while I'm talking. I'll be manning the chat while she's talking. So we will try and get to you right um, as quickly as we can. Um, and then if you wanna use the reaction buttons, um, that's great because we can, we can get a little bit of feedback as we're going through. We are going to ask you to rename yourselves today just so we can get an idea of who all is in the room. So if you would like to do that, what you need to do is you can go to participants, click on participants and find your name in the list. And to the right hand side, you will see a little blue button that says more. And when you click on that blue button, one of them will say rename. We're going to ask you to rename yourself just by putting a comma after your name and where you're from. So you can see my example up there on the slide it says Denise Kate Starnell and SBCSS. So we just kind of want to get an idea where everybody is from so that we have some sense of that. Thank you so much. And we'll give you just a moment or two. If you would like to do um, rename yourself the other way, if you just find your picture on the screen in the right hand corner, there are three little dots or we call them the jelly beans. So if you click on those jelly beans, it will also give you a little tab to rename yourself as well. So today um, you have myself, I'm Denise Kate Starnell. I'm a curriculum coordinator here at San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools for mathematics, pre-K through eighth grade. And with me today, I'm so excited to be presenting with my colleague um, is Rosemary Heider. And she's also a curriculum coordinator for the new multilingual education department. So. Um, we'll okay. both be our, uh, your team for today. So we're going to start today by just thinking uh, and thinking about math a little bit. And so we want to do a quick activity called which one doesn't belong. And I'd like you to look at these four pictures and you can see that each one has a letter above it and think about which one doesn't belong. And in the chat, I'm going to ask you to respond by telling us which one you think doesn't belong and why. But since we are focusing on supporting English learners, I've given you a few response frames. So I could say, I notice that A doesn't belong because it's the only one that has a B on the left-hand side but the other three have sort of a, an eagle or a shield there. So you can come up with a reason why you think one doesn't belong and put that in the chat for us. And you're free to use our response frames there to support you. Ooh, we've got responses coming in okay. already. Thank you so much. Let's see if I can find some of these. Okay, I have, I noticed that D doesn't belong because it has a blue strip. Okay, B doesn't belong. He's the only one facing towards the left. Okay, in my opinion, D doesn't belong because it's the only one that is not green. I, oh, I like this. I noticed that C does not belong because it is not a multiple of 10 right? 
Um, let's see, I've got lots of D's. Oh, D doesn't belong because it's a new style of bill and the rest are the old style, great. In my opinion, C doesn't belong because it does not have a one in it. Excellent. I love how you're finding different ways of looking at this. Um, lots of things that we can say. D doesn't belong, it's a different color. B doesn't belong. Again, his, his head is facing the other direction. Uh, somebody said that A doesn't belong because it is not a multiple of five. Great. And I also that A doesn't belong because it is the smallest value. We've got a lot of people online, so I'm going to let you go through the chat and see some of the others. I love the language that you're using. And so what we want to be talking about today is how we can increase the language that our students use in math class. So this is a great activity for students to work with. There is no right answer. Right? It is just finding something that is unique about one of those objects in our picture there so that we can, um, and supporting our answers. So using that to justify our response and thinking of our math language. So we know that our math learners have a double challenge excuse me, our English learners have a double challenge as they are learning math. They really have to learn a new language in an academic setting. While they are learning that language, they have to learn the knowledge and skills in multiple disciplines. So they are doing double duty. Um, and we're gonna be using a few um, pieces today from the Stanford Graduate School of Education, their scale unit, understanding language. So you'll see those. And I'm gonna let Rosemary take on the next part here. Yeah, so as we're introducing that quote, we're thinking about how am I planning my instruction to meet the needs of my students who are English learners? And you have these three resources, two of them I'm sure you're familiar with, with our math framework and our ELD standards. The other resource I wasn't too familiar with and I didn't really, but um, then when we came out, I was like, oh goodness, this is such an amazing resource. So if you're not familiar with it, take a look at these resources. They are in the drive for you. The, and I think we'd put it in the chat. I think we probably need to put it again because we're still admitting people into our group here. So again, there are resources for you to, um, Oops, there we go. Helping all students mat meet mathematical language demands, and it requires careful planning, um, attention to the demand, language demands, lesson, unit, module, ongoing monitoring. So again, monitoring of our students' understanding of the language concepts, um, engaging in discussion about math topics, explain their reasoning, justify their procedures and conclusions, and then hopefully uh, the vision is that your classroom will become a vi will come, become vibrant with conversation. And then again, which will help your English learners progress in their proficiency. And on our next slide here are the proficiency level descriptors. And it is in your stan ELD standards book right there that you have in your drive now. And we just wanted you to remember, and most some of you already know this, so it's a repetition for on our part here, the merging, expanding, bridging levels of English learners, the three proficiency level descriptors there. Um, take a look down at the bottom corner, where it says high level thinking with linguistic support. And that is part something that you want to think about when you're planning for instruction. Remember, English learners possess cognitive ability appropriate to their age and experience. In order to communicate about their thinking as they learn English, they may need varying linguistic support depending on their linguistic and cognitive demand of the task. Okay, so on the bottom there, it's um, emerging, you see, requires substantial support. You have your expanding students will require moderate support, and then your bridging students will require 
light support. And then we also want you to remember that, you know, they are bringing in their native language, they are bringing, coming in with some assets, and you want you to recognize that as well. Okay. And on the next three slides, actually, we um, took screenshots for you. So your mode of communication, again, this is also in your book, um, the ELD proficiency level continuum. And you can see at the early stage of emerging, so you see the red arrows pointing to the emerging level students, the early stages, and then when they exit where they should be. So again, progress monitoring, where they will come into you with and where they're leaving. And um, next slide is our expanding. No, love when, there it is. <laughs> so expanding students there at the early stages of expanding. Again, one of the things that we want to highlight is do you know the students on your roster? Because they say, it says EL, what level are they at? You also want to show, you don't want to dummy down curriculum and then you also don't want to give um, not enough support or too much support, depending on what level they are at. Okay. So our next is our bridging level. Again, same things for you there. The early stages of bridging level, students are able to perform the following tasks. And then when they exit, what they should be. And hopefully at this point, you're looking at reclassification for those students and the support that you've provided to get them out of there. And important considerations. So here's another piece to it all. You have newcomers that you'll require, they'll require focus on foundational language, uh, working on uh, minimal pairing, pictorial input, provide individual language frames and chats, visual word banks. I know you could read all of this, but I want you to see that in all three, repetition is listed. And also uh, ELs with disabilities, there is a guidance book that is out on that as well, but um, our department's also collaborating with SELPA and there will be two workshops, I believe in December. So if, um, if you want information on that, just let us know and we'll get you that. Again, don't make assumptions on where it says the long-term English learners, don't make assumptions regarding language skills. That's something very much, and then you see all the considerations for eels with disabilities. I just want to highlight some things, even though you have your proficiency levels to look out for these as well when you consider your planning for instruction. And so this table's from our math framework. And that may, so again, those resources, very valuable. This is just one picture that we took out that you could see how useful it is. So if you're thinking about what you're going to be doing, look on the side there, it says words whose meanings are found only in math and used in academic English. And if you look at the symbolic language almost universally. So if you look at those symbols, they are used universally. And so again, when you think of English learners, even newcomers, even if they're not speaking English, they understand those symbols. Okay. Words with multiple meanings in everyday English that you want to address, we'll get into some more of that later. Words with multiple meaning in academic English. And then you can see the phonological similar words. Right? Sometimes we hear them even like, did you say tens or tenths, right? So expressing those clearly. And, um, Oh, we won't go into if we're wearing masks, right? <laughs> if they can see you or not. <laughs> All right, so strategies that support English and learning in math. Uh, these are all strategies that you can look at. I see activating prior knowledge. These are all things that you all probably do right now, but we wanted to focus on sentence frames and creating vocabulary banks. Ah, banks that, that we want to focus on for this one here. We're going to look at some sentence frames and some strategies that you can use. Next slide here. So guide to differentiating sentence frames here. Um, again, we took this uh, from Elizabeth Jimenez Salinas. She does things with newcomers and she does, uh, she's a consultant that's worked with us before. She's, um, she did a great job of getting those emerging sentence frames, expanding, which you can use for bridging. Again, giving them that rigor where they need it, 
the tense, the first, next, the short phrases for emerging students. And you can see how you can use this in math because a lot of times they think ELA, ELD, and it stops right there, right? And that's why we're bringing this to you because there's a lot of language in math that can support your English learners to get into that level of proficiency. Huh? I like that, yep, just popped up on the bottom there. <laughs> Thank you, Luna. So um, with the rectangles here, um, what can you use for sentence frames here, right? So you can put in the chat if you're doing distance learning. So you have um, a rectangle has four sides, right? It has, those are all things that you can put in the chat and make sure that the students have the opportunity to say those out loud somewhere. We have somebody in the waiting room. Okay, got it. <laughs> um, again, sentence frames helps not only your English learners, it's really good for all students. Um, we use that term in um, UDL as well, what seems necessary for these students. It's we always say it's all it's good for all students this is just good teaching but again when you're using this this is really necessary for our english learners to be able to put sentences and and under, have an understanding of where it's coming from um let's see what else did i have here the next slide oh no we'll go ahead are there any questions about sentence frames? You can put in the chat. Um, there's a lot. Kate Kinsella also is another one that has lots of frames for you in um, all the content areas, even math that, that you can, um, if you want that resource, we can also get you that resource. So I'd like to take a moment and shift just a little bit about one very specific um, thing that seems to be really difficult. Not only is it difficult for our English learners, it's difficult for all of our students, but particularly for English learners, and that is solving word problems. So what is it? Just take a moment and pop something in the chat, and I'm going to ask you for just a second to hold your response and not click return. So I want, don't click return. So don't send anything in the chat window until I give you. We're gonna just do a quick waterfall, which is another strategy we can use in the chat. So think about what makes word problems so difficult for our English learners. Go ahead and put that in the chat, but don't hit return until I give you the signal. And I'm gonna give you about 15, 20 seconds to put your response in before we start checking. I see okay. your I see your, I see your question there, Debbie, about a specific Kate uh, book. Yeah, definitely. Just email me, and I'll send you those resources, or I can put, add them to our drive as well. Okay. All right. You ready to re hit your response? Why are word problems so difficult for our EL students? Go ahead and hit return. Oh, we've got so many uh, vocabulary, wording, understanding the academic language. Again, understanding vocabulary. Oh, students cling to familiar words and try to solve the problem by using the vocabulary they understand. Yes. We've got lots of people saying, um, Things about reading, again, lack of vocabulary, lack of vocabulary. They're not sure what key information they need to use to solve the problem. Oh, there's so many things here about having to do with reading, vocabulary, exactly. So we know exactly what is giving our students some struggle with word problems. So let's take a look at a few and see what we can find out when we take a look at these problems. So we have a five pound box of sugar costs $1.80 and contains 12 cups of sugar. Marella and Mark are making a batch of cookies. The recipe calls for two cups of sugar. Determine how much the sugar for the cookies costs. Hmm. 
Well, I know right away that some, that there's a problem here, right? In fact, we've got a little time bomb for our students that's gonna give them some trouble. And that is batch and recipe. If a student does not know those vocabulary words that batch and recipe are being used as synonyms here, they are going to have a lot of trouble solving this particular problem, aren't they? Let's take a look at another one. The Upper Angel Falls, the highest waterfall on earth, are 750 meters higher than Niagara Falls. If each of the falls were seven meters lower, the Upper Angel Falls would be 16 times as high as Niagara Falls. How high is each waterfall? Well, once again, we've got a trick that's going, or something that's really going to trip them up. And again, it's by vocabulary. We've got Upper Angel Falls, Lower Niagara Falls, Waterfall, Upper, Lower, each of those things is going to cause a comprehension issue in solving that particular um, problem. Let's take a look at some different issues. John wants to make wooden bookcases that are two feet wide. He has two five foot long boards. How many two foot long boards can he cut from them? Well, about 70% of kids answered five here, and they forgot something important, that math is about making sense, right? Kids sometimes see it as not making sense because I can't make a two foot long board out of two one foot long pieces, can I? So I have to think through the context of what's being asked. I've got one more for us. So a dragonfly, the fastest insect, can fly a distance of 50 feet in about two seconds. How long will it take for the dragonfly to fly 375 feet? Well, one of the things we tell kids maybe is to make a model that that could help. So here's a model that was created by a student, but Sometimes our kids are getting hung up because they don't know what's the relevant information. How do I make a picture of it that is actually going to help me to solve the problem? So we're going to talk about us. Oh, sorry, I'm jumping the gun. I want to say one more thing about what makes these so difficult. Our students spend a lot of time working on reading, right? They focus in on reading and they understand the structure of stories. They understand the structure that they may find in their science or social studies textbook. And that is that at the beginning of the paragraph, typically I'm given a topic sentence and then I get details about that specific topic, more and more details. But when we turn that around in math, now when I'm reading, I get details, 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 and it's not until the very end that I know why I'm reading and how all of those things are connected by my question. So that can really throw our students. So some of the strategies that we find that help kids to make sense of word problems are thinking about reading the problem aloud, right? before showing a printed version, having students chorally read, um, maybe using synonyms for unfamiliar words as we're reading along and explaining, um, identifying words that may be multiple meanings or have homophones and so we can clarify the meanings as they're going through. Sometimes we like to have students practice retelling the problem or even thinking about um, um, acting out the problem using manipulatives or realia or each other. Or again, we do come up with that strategy of drawing a picture so that that can help me think about the problem. So this is a strategy called reaching consensus. And real quickly, what it is, is a procedure 
at the end of a lesson where students have an opportunity to share in a group and go over their answers that they may have gotten in individual practice. So they get an opportunity to explain to their classmates why they may have gotten an answer or why they may have gotten a different answer and talk through what might be wrong or right within their problem. And then they get an opportunity to explain and articulate how they solved that problem. So this comes from um, Multilingual Learners and English Learners, which is a brand new publication from the CDE um, that actually just came out this week, I think. <laughs> so we just got a chance to look at that and pull yes. <laughs> out from that. Yeah, and it is in your drive as well. So we did put that document in your drive. It went to a lot of your leads in your districts and they'll be sharing it with you. So it, like Denise said, it just came out yesterday. I'm um, not yesterday, last week. <laughs> so I would like to talk to you just a little bit though about um, mathematical language routines. And these routines came out of that understanding language group from Stanford and they've created eight discussion routines that support students in really becoming articulate and able to express themselves and express their mathematical thinking. So we're going to talk about one of those routines. I just want to draw your attention that one of the routines we already did one example of, and that was our which one doesn't belong up front. It was we were able to look at some pictures of things and then express our ideas about our opinions. So we were articulating our opinion and then having to justify it um, with to our colleagues. We're going to talk about a routine called Three Reads this afternoon. And so um, the Three Reads routine is really helpful when we're looking at those word type problems because its purpose is to help those students learn to read like a mathematician so that they are really paying attention to those ideas of quantities and relationships in the problem statement so that they are able to um, really comprehend what the problem is about and what it is that they are going to be looking to find in, in that problem. So the steps are pretty easy. We're going to be reading the problem three times. I'm going to ask you to grab a piece of paper for this that we'll use because there's a few things that I do want you to write down as we go through. But together, we're going to go through this process. Um, and I'm actually using the process that came from Fostering Math Practices, which is Routines for Reasoning, is the name of the book from um, Grace Kalamenic and Amy, and shoot, Amy's last name just popped out of my head. Um, so there are multiple sources where you can find this routine if you'd like to use it with your students as well as here. So in the first read, the teacher is going to read the problem and you are going to be thinking about what is the problem about? And you'll notice that I've put a response frame there for you, the problem is about. So in the chat, I'd like, thank you, Amy Lucinta. I'd like you to put um, what the problem is about in the chat window in just a moment. So I'm going to read that right now, hang on. Jing and Ella, bought a bag of marbles to share. Jing opened the bag and she gave half of the marbles to Ella. Then she gave two of her marbles to her brother. Jing had four marbles left for herself. So what is the problem about? Great, somebody said the problem's about sharing marbles. I have lots of people saying marbles, marbles. Maybe the problem's about dividing marbles, possibly. Mm -hmm. So I've got lots of people thinking, what is the context of this particular problem? Yes, everybody's getting that. 
the problems about sharing marbles with friends. Sharing marbles, we don't know yet what it is though that we're going to be asked to figure out. But now what I want you to do before we go any further is to think what might the question be that we're going to be asked to think about in this particular problem? What could the question be? And go ahead and put that in the chat. And I'm going to give you just a moment to think about that. I've got a few answers coming in. How many marbles were there all together? How many marbles were in the bag? How many marbles did she give her friend? How many marbles did she have left? How many marbles did they start with? How many marbles were in the bag before she gave half two and two to his brother? Okay. How many marbles will Jing have? the amount of marbles in the bag. So lots of great ideas of what could be our question. So this time we're going to do our second read. And this time we're going to listen to find out what the question is. So in our second read, we're going to read together. So I'm going to put the problem on our screen but I want you to notice down below here on the right hand side of the screen before I do, we have a couple of um, response frames for you when we come to what is the question. So we could say the question is, or we need to find out, or you can um, rephrase the question as you would prefer to do. So let's look at the problem and read it together. Ready? Jing and Ella bought a bag of marbles to share. Jing opened the bag and she gave half of the marbles to Ella. Then she gave two of her marbles to her brother. Jing had four marbles left for herself. How many marbles were in the bag at the start? Okay, you know what? I'm going to ask a couple of people to think about unmuting themselves and to share your restatement of the question with an open mic. So let me just give you a moment to think about that. And if I have somebody that's ready, go ahead and share what the question is by unmuting yourself and just saying it out loud to us. How many marbles were in the bag at the start? Oh, thank you, Janet. Yay. Okay, how many mar marbles were in the bag at the start? Thank you. Anybody else have another way of restating the question? How many marbles were in the bag at the beginning? Ah, thank you. So we have some different language that we can, that we can, excellent, so that we can make sure that our students are understanding that, hearing some synonyms, hearing other ways that we can articulate the language to make it make sense. Thank you. So right now on your piece of paper, I would like for you to make a I have to statement. So what is it that you have to find out to solve this particular question? So just write a statement, I have to, and I'll give you about 20 seconds to put that down for yourself.
Okay, great. I love, I've got a couple people that shared out in the chat. So I'm going to share um, what they wrote. I have to find out how many marbles were in the bag at the beginning. Perfect. Or I have to figure out how many, uh oh, it jumped up. I have to find out how many marbles did they start with. So exactly, we want to make sure that our students are clarifying. And now we've done that orally, so they've gotten a chance to speak it, and now they're getting a chance to write it as well. Now, this time we're going to do a third read. And in this read, we want to listen for what is the important information in our problem. So if we were in the regular classroom, I would probably have students work with a partner and read together and identify this important information. Because we're with a group, we're just going to um, read Corley again and think about what is the important information. And again, in the right hand side, I've given a couple of response frames. The important information is, the information I need to answer the question is. Okay, so here comes our problem for us to read one more time. Okay, so Jing and Ella bought a bag of marbles to share. Jing opened the bag and she gave half of the marbles to Ella. Then she gave two of her marbles to her brother. Jing had four marbles left for herself. How many marbles were in the bag to start? Okay, so I'm going to ask a couple of people to un mute themselves again and tell us what is one piece of important information that I need to have for the, to solve this problem. She gave half of the marbles to Ella. Okay, thank you so much, Dawn. Oops, come on. Oh, great, sorry. She had two, two um, gave two to her brother. Okay. There we go. Okay, this isn't going to work for me because my computer is not working very happily. There, so we had two of her marbles for her brother, right? Okay two of the marbles. And did we also say half of the marbles? Yes. Okay, so we have half of the marbles. Okay, anything else that's really important for us to know? Jing had four marbles four left marbles for herself. Okay, Jing had four marbles left for herself. Um, what about um, Jean had um, six before she shared two? Um, That's important because we will know to double that and figure out the answer. Where does it tell us that she had six? Four plus two. Ah. So if she... Mm, okay. So it didn't say that, did it? But we can infer that if we, um, by thinking about the two and the four, yes. What other information might we have that's really important for us to, to know? Anything else? The question. Yep, we've got that question down there. How many marbles were in the bag to start? Okay, 
So we know this and this, and then you're right, we can double to find out how many she started out with. Excellent. All right, so at this point, we've already kind of looked at how we might solve it. As adults, we kind of jump to that. But at this point, I want my students to write an I will statement because I want them to think about what tools or strategies will I use to help me solve the problem? This is not my solution. This is my plan for how I'm going to solve this problem. So is there a tool that can help me? Is there, would a, would a drawing help me? Or making a picture of what's happening? Um, does a table help me? Um, do I need to use manipulatives? to help me solve it? What kind of manipulatives would I use? So please write an I will statement to articulate your plan of how you will solve the problem. Great, I love that I'm seeing some of you putting it in the chat, that's terrific. If you don't have your piece of paper, that's a great way to do it. So we have some people saying they're gonna make a picture of it and then give a number sentence. That's exactly what we want to think about. We want our students to do, I'll use counters to help me solve it, draw a picture, okay? So thinking about articulating what our plan is for solving that particular problem. So we've not even solved our problem yet, have we? But we've spent all of this time supporting, discussing, articulating around that. And now we get to make our solution, but our students have a lot more language and a lot more practice about how to unpack that particular problem. So. I would like for us to spend just a moment in breakout rooms. So I'm gonna ask you to take that piece of paper that you have in your hand and we're using and flip it over and just on the back to make a quick T chart. So I want you to think about these two things. What is the teacher doing in this routine and what are the students doing in this routine? As you're thinking of those two things, you might also be thinking about how does this three-read strategy support mathematical sense-making? How does it support the language output for students? And how does it support collaboration? I'm going to give you about four minutes to discuss in your group. And just before we go into groups, I want to ask, does anyone have a question about what we're going to do in our breakout room? Can I have one brave person who's going to tell us the directions for our breakout room task? We're gonna make a T-chart and on one side list what the teacher is doing and the other side what the students are doing. Excellent, okay. And remember, be thinking about how it helps students to make sense of the math, how it helps students perhaps with the language around the math and how does it support collaboration? Okay, Rosemary, go ahead and send us to breakout rooms if you would, please. I need this up here. So as, um, as Denise and I were planning for this, you know, we kept thinking about bringing in something different. And so I'm not sure if everyone in here is familiar with the LPAC assessment, right? If you're not, let us know and we'll give you some information on that. But it is what English learners have to take an initial and a uh, summative. So the initial actually, um, gives them the classification as English learners, and then they'll take the summative 
in the spring. So in February is about when it starts. So as we were going through the three read and some of the other strategies for you, I want you to look at the domains that they're tested on in the LPAP. So you have the speaking, listening, and reading and writing domains. Okay. So again, as we were looking at the different lessons that we were covering, did it cover those domains and like the three read? Okay. Just giving you some time to look at it. All, all of these domain sheets are in the drive for you as well in big, nice form so you can look at them. But for today, we're just going to focus on the speaking domain. So one thing that we've noticed with, um, let me just shrink my, the pictures here so I can see. Ah. So one thing we've noticed with distance learning is that students aren't given ample time to speak in class um, or given that same opportunity. So we took what I did was I took the domain sheet and thought, well, let me just break it apart just so that you can attack just some of these with your class. So if you look at the bubble there, are students given an opportunity to practice speaking during your math lessons nowadays? Is it hard? Yes, <laughs> it is. Because your constraints of time, you know, every district's different, every site's different, every teacher's different on how they're planning their math lessons. So what I did is the purpose is there, the task types allow students to show their abilities in speaking English, okay? And if you look at one of the things that they're assessed on is talk about a scene. So the student is presented with an illustration of a familiar scene. The text, test examiner first has three questions of who, what, where, when type questions. Um, in the scene, the test examiner then administers the three items. So if you look, I took the training test that you have access to also there in the drive and you see the questions that are asked of the students. So what are the students learning? And you wait for the student's response, right? How do you know? Are these questions, Denise, that they can ask in a math class? Absolutely. So we did it a couple of times today. Actually, we did our which one doesn't belong, right? We could have been describing, and several of you did describe one of those, um, the pieces of money that we had in some way so that we understood which one, why it didn't belong. We also could use them when we did response frames, describing the geometric shapes that we were looking at there. So those are just two really quick and easy examples of ways that we could bring that describing piece or that we're supporting what is happening on the LPAC in math class as well. So again, I just put the score of two because we don't want to look at zero or one, right? So this is the maximum score they can get on talk about a scene. So here it gives you the responses here. So the response is relevant and errors in grammar, pronunciation or intonation do not impede meaning. So they ask, what are the students learning? And if the student responds how to make paper animals, then they're getting a score of two. Does that make sense? Um, the examiner then asks, how do you know? And this is the student's sample response because um, they have paper animals on the table and that is a high score. So if they're, then the examiner asks, describe what is on the walls in the classrooms, like lots of sunny pictures, animals, and nature. So that is a score of two. Okay. Again, we're looking at just so the samples that you can um, take back and say like, oh, okay, this is what, you can go to the next one, Denise. Um, so again, here's another task type. This is still on speaking, supporting an opinion, right? So here are the questions that the teacher asks here with the score will give you. And then some examples or samples of what a student's response will look like will give them the score of three. And again, the whole training test is there for you in the drive so you can look through it. Uh, are students given opportunities to explain their answer with supporting details? And then Denise, did you yes. did, did some lessons here, right? Yes. <laughs> our which one doesn't belong did this, our mm -hmm. three reads did this. So we're really supporting that SMP3 where students have to create an opinion and um, 
listen to others and critique the reasoning of others, but also be able to support what their opinion is as well. So we're kind of covering both aspects as when we add these kinds of routines into the math class. Right, and there, explain your choice by giving relevant reasons. Those are all things that you can incorporate in the questions you ask. So when the student comes into the examination, you can um, they'll half the battle is does the student understand what you're asking asking them to do, right? If they can understand the questions, then they have an easier time responding. And again, it's all about allowing students time to speak and which has been taken away with a lot of our distance learning. But if you can intentionally plan for that, it will really support your students in moving into that level of proficiency in English. And here's another one, summarize an academic presentation. So the student listens to an academic presentation while looking at related pictures. So are the, in your lessons, are they looking at pictures while you're presenting a lesson? Or are they just listening to you talk? And then, um, they're prompted to summarize the main points of what you've already directed them to do. Again, their main points are there for you to look at. Um, what the student is asked to do is summarize the information you heard. Be sure to explain. So this is about sound waves, how sound waves work. Include all the steps in demonstration. So this thinking about procedural steps in math. Can they explain that? Or can you put them into groups or breakout rooms so that they can talk to each other about a problem you've just presented in math? And then using relevant details and clear language. So the score of four is there for you, what the res four, four response looks like, and then some samples of what students have said that gives them the score of a four. Okay. And Denise, you can go into any other problem that, or are we out of time? <laughs> I was going to say we did that in our three reads as yes. well. Yes, we had to summarize that what the problem was about, put it in their own words. Um, yeah, it our time is up. We do want to thank you for making us part of your day. Thank you for being here. Next time we meet will be on December 16. We will be talking about more. Um, routines, math language routines, um, that are some that are a little lesser known. And we'll also be talking about the EL roadmap and how we can make connections with that. And we look forward to seeing you in December. Everybody have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Um, and if you have any questions, we'll be happy to stay on. And um, please feel free to put something in the chat or unmute yourself. And um, shout out. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Well done, ladies. Thank hey, you. Lily. Hey, thanks for being here. Yep. Sorry I was late. I was, you know, no. another meeting. Oh, well, gotcha. No, I'm just not. looking at making sure anything else isn't in the comments. <laughs> oh, Isela, you're okay. And again, the recording we sent to them, right, um, Denise? Um, the recording is going to go up on your website, I understand, Rosemary. Yes. So, um, that's what we had talked about with Maria. I don't know if we're going to put it in both places. Melanie, we could talk about that if we want to. I think we need to edit a little bit before we do that. Okay. Can you please share the website that you're talking about? I'm sorry? Can you please share the website where it will be available? Yeah, Rosemary, what is your website? Do you have I that? Will, yes, I can copy that right now for you. Thank you. And uh, actually, Denise, uh, Maria usually does is everybody on OMS will just shoot them out the link for the recording with the resources. We can do that as well, but let me okay. get to. That's perfectly fine. Um, okay, so we'll get an email through. Yeah, you'll get an email. Can okay, yeah. I can do that too. All right, thank you so much, ladies. Thank you. Yeah, I think she sends it out through OMS. But yeah. She through OMS, yeah. Because as soon as it's like a thank you for participating with the link and the resources, and then um, we usually send the recording link as well on there. Right. No, we could do that. And I can't find the. No problem. I should have it tagged here, but I know we've been doing some changes. 
<laughs> Any questions, anyone? Who's still on the line? No, I'll see you guys later. Have a good evening. Bye, Bye see Melanie. You. Bye. Bye then, Melanie. Mm -hmm. We think we have two left. <laughs> okay, any questions? Okay. Thanks. Oh, well. Thank you, Norma. Oh, she's already hung up. Okay, there we go. Um, okay. Wow, it still says, oh no, that's, me that's messages in the chat. <laughs> yeah. A whole oh. bunch that I didn't see. Okay, I just moved uh, Luna. She was still on. I put her into the waiting room. <laughs> oh, okay. I, she okay. didn't have any questions or anything, but she was still in the. <laughs> okay, it looks like just like, thank you. Can you please share your email again? Oh, and it was on the end. That's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Was attendance being tracked? Somebody asked, but they didn't stay on to find out. Oh, that was nice. Oh, attendance link. What did she mean by that? No attendance. Um, I told Kimberly that I would track the attendance for them. So if we, get, I'm gonna. Um, Can you show me how to do that? I, I don't know how to do that part. Yeah. So let me close this, and okay. I'm going to close our presentation. I can't believe how fast it goes. It goes so quickly. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I had I have had the worst headache all day long. Oh. I could not get rid of it. But now it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> so something while we while we were doing, you know, it took my mind off enough that I didn't have a headache anymore. Okay, so I've got to share my screen with you. And it got so hot. I'm going to take off my jacket because it, that. <laughs> yeah, I never got hot. <laughs> sun, oh my, the sun just started beaming in here. And I was like, oh. oh. <laughs> okay, so let's see if we can do this. Okay. So I'm going to go to my account. And so um, I'm going to go to meetings. I'm not positive we can do this because we're still on it, but I think we can because most people have gone out of it. Oh, okay. So, oh, I gotta go to reports. Oh, 